Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode from our community calls. This time we're starting what uh, hopefully is going to be a series of calls targeting mainly um, topics and issues related to our Ukrainian friends and folks, amazing people in Ukraine who are working with the situation at the moment. Um, today we are talking about our very famous um, topic, I would say, tackling the, the, the topic of open culture, something that we often refer to in our small little community at GIG and in our world of makerspaces and innovators. We talk about open documentation. We talk about openness as a value that we, um, that we adapt or adopt, I would say. Uh, but we never... We, maybe we never often have the time to talk about what we mean by it. And it's such a great and big concept that could branch out in so many places. And it happened to be that it was one of the topics tackled in the context of our Ukrainian friends with Vicky involved, who was there also um, uh, at some point on the ground. And we thought, hey, Maybe we can take that opportunity to talk about open culture in, in general, but also to talk about the importance uh, of, of what we call openness um, in, in the context of maybe crisis um, mode or in, in the context of other countries that still are not very familiar with this and um, might make use of it at some point. So we have with us today the amazing Stephen Kovat, our um, all-time gig member, signing in from Berlin, who's actually the founder of Rogue for Open Culture and Critical Transform Transformation, which actually explains why he's going to be our speaker, so so to say, uh, for today. We also have Vicky, who's an old gig member and co-founder of Gig, and who's been very, very um, was, who's been working on the topic since a long time. And we have uh, Konstantin signing in from Ukraine. Hello. So um, I'm going to hand over to Vicky, who's going to be moderating the call uh, for today. And uh, I'm, I'm just would like to welcome everyone and thank you again for being here as part of our um, uh, community calls that we've been carrying out for the past year. Please feel free at some point to open up your mics and ask questions and jump into the discussion because this is exactly what we mean by a community call. So thank you. Vicky, over to you. Thank you so much, Fabia. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll be moderating, um, which I hope basically means just to say, okay, thanks. How about we turn to someone else now? Um, and also, please feel free to do that with me as well, because we have three people here who talk a lot. Um, but but Steve and Constantine both always talk about very interesting things. So um, yeah, please do join the conversation. Um, I want to start though with giving a little bit of a spotlight on Stephen. Um, I've also invited. Um, friends from Ukraine, um, telling them how much I thought of Steve when I met them, which is 100% true. Um, because I, I, whenever I'm there, I'm like, oh my God, I wish Steve could see that. And I wonder what he would propose here. He would be so excited. And then I'm always the only one who's super excited. And I think sometimes it weirds people out how excited I am about what they do, but I just am. And so it gives me really great pleasure to um, have to people meet and to introduce um, them to each other and to start. Although quite a lot of people on this call know Steve very well, <clears throat> I wanted to say, Steve, tell us a little bit about you. Like, what are you doing? What have you been up to in the last couple of years that may or may not relate to open culture? <laughs> okay, well, thanks, uh, Vicky uh, and to Fadia for the uh, for the invitation. Um, I hope um, I hope you hear me okay. Um, it's okay, yeah, because I've, I've I've been having a few little tech issues with sound lately. That's one of the things I've been dealing with lately. Um, and yeah, I mean, as you said, I guess I've been involved in this area of open culture 
um, well, actually very much what our organization is called, right? We are the rogue agency uh, and rogue, yes, very much in its, in, in its definition of looking at things differently, trying to do things differently in order to help change systems, um, but in a positive way. Um, so it's the rogue agency for open culture and critical transformation. So we are very much interested yeah, in this, in this notion of looking at things through a critical, one could say maybe critical media lens uh, quite often. And um, this organization, which is a small nonprofit uh, organization in Berlin, uh, of which Vicky is also a part of in a certain way. Um, and Fadia, Fadia, in fact, was one of our earlier uh, members as well before she went to gig. Um, it's existed for 10 years, but it was built, it was built on a notion um, coming after, let's say, 25 years of practice that I had up to then, um, dealing with yeah, issues of, I would say, art, media, technology, social transformation, and design, um, where I had worked also in a number of contexts in the so-called realm of international development, whatever exactly that is, um, and quite frustrated at the extremely closed environment um, that so-called development takes place in. And I was interested to see, for example, what is the role that open source and open educational resources, publicly available resources in general, what these could play in so-called international development, especially in so-called conflict or post-conflict transformation um, contexts. Um, I say this because um, there are a lot of organizations, a lot of governments, which are out there trying sort of, I guess, to help build things up where things may have been destroyed, uh, but they don't tend to share information. It's a very hermetically sealed um, environment. And this hermetically sealed environment does not foster innovation. It does not foster entrepreneurship. Um, I don't know, in fact, what it fosters at all. Um, while at the same time, most of this is funded by public tax money, which is an open and public purse. So the money I pay in taxes in Germany uh, should, in my opinion, go into knowledge resources that then can be shared with other people um, and not closed or put into silos. So this is just a general kind of background or why we got into this. And we are a group of people who are coming from various backgrounds, various countries, who have an interest in, um, I guess what one could say, collaborative enterprise and how collaborative enterprise can be used to fuel innovation um, and to support communities in becoming independent. Um, so not depending on the international development industry, but are actually able to access information, access knowledge in order you know, to make things happen. So that's a very, very general <laughs> uh, scenario. Um, and I guess, you know, in the context of Ukraine, it, it applies in some ways, in some ways, maybe not. Um, um, me, for me personally, um, I spent the 1990s, so the whole decade of the 1990s, working in and around so-called Eastern and Central Europe, looking at the role that media, media culture, open technology was playing in the transformation of sort of like post Cold War Europe. Um, so I traveled a lot 
in so-called Eastern and Central Europe. I was based in Eastern Germany at the time. I had the pleasure also to go to Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, I was, uh, I was also arrested and detained and declared a persona non grata in the Ukraine. <laughs> um, and for a number of reasons, I haven't been able to go back, um, not because of that, I guess, um, but I have very fond memories <laughs> um, and I'm very interested in seeing where things will go in Ukraine. Um, I mean, we're obviously in a whole new, yeah, a, you know, massively changed world. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to, you know, help in any way I can, you know, to share information, knowledge, whatever experiences with um, people who are interested in the same in Ukraine. So I, I'm, uh, I'm very keen to meet uh, the people that Vicky um, and the Sitolokar project has been working with. Um, I, I love the whole region um, and I want to see it succeed and become strong and resilient. So, Vicky, is that, is that okay? L little intro from somebody who talks too much. That is a total okay intro for anybody. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> um, one thing you didn't mention and that I need to mention now because I need it as a bridge in my fantastically prepared moderation. Um, you spent some time in Rotterdam, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't going to go into my my whole sordid history, but... Um, you only need Rotterdam. <laughs> yeah, well, R Rotterdam is, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not just Rotterdam. Um, so when I started this work in the 90s, dealing with what I was saying of transformation process of Eastern Central Europe, um, I'm... So I'm an architect, actually, for those of you who might not know, that is actually my background. I'm not a media theorist or a development specialist or an ethnographer, but architecture brings those things together. And for me, the notion of media, especially electronic media and the reproducibility of electronic media as opposed to film um, is something which I always considered to be a so-called unstable media. Um, and I look at it as materiality. And I was, I was fascinated when I first heard and saw that there's an organization in Rotterdam, which was the Institute for the Unstable Media. And I had the pleasure more or less by accident at some point uh, to become their um, international programs curator. So I joined this institution in Rotterdam called the Institute for the Unstable Media because it was very much my home, even though I didn't know that before. Um, and uh, this organization, um, and it's on one of the links that I sent to both you and Fadia, v2.nl. I'm sorry, I can't put these directly into the chat here. Um, um, it's, uh, yeah, V2, Institute for the Unstable Media. Um, it's one of the oldest media and tech labs in Europe or maybe in the world. It's not sort of the mother of all hack spaces and it's not really a hacker space, but it embodies the notion of open technologies, uh, creative and collaborative enterprise and has done numerous projects with basically this intersection of, of art, design, um, and, and culture. Um, and, and I think is a, it's a wonderful place actually for everybody to look at um, in terms of really what this intersectional space of, of so-called unstable media is about, because this is also a very political space um, it's, it is also a space of innovation, um, and as opposed to other similar organizations, for example, in the Netherlands, which are also very much out there and known, very, very good in organizations, um, doing great work, 
the notion of unstable media because of its political and cultural sense, um, I think has a special space and something that we can learn um, from in all fields, I think, of, for example, the, from the people who are part of GIG. So I, does, does that help, Vicky? <laughs> That's excellent. Um, so I needed it as a bridge because I know, and I don't know exactly where and when and how, and that's not part of it, but one of the people who made some of this unstable media in the early 2000s in the Netherlands was Konstantin. And uh, we found out about that waiting to cross the border into Ukraine on the first day that we actually met in person. And I was super, again, right, I'm always excited uh, and wish that Steve was there when anything happens in Ukraine. And so um, that was the first of those moments. And so, Konstantin, also for you, how much of what Steve said about open culture resonates with you? And as the team lead on the ground for Toloka in Ukraine, um, how much of that echoes what, what you also feel um, Toloka could do? How much is it different? Like, give us, give us your, your, your thoughts right now. And also enlighten me about what you did in Rotterdam again. Uh, well, every single bit resonates uh, as close as it gets. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm contemplating and trying to have the dialogues yeah. within the within the Toloka team and outside, and just kind of trying to uh, to find a way and approach. And more and more, I'm getting convinced that probably. The, mo the most effective way that the Toloka could engage with the with the Ukrainian community is purely through open source technologies. Uh, because for us, the most important thing is building networks and knowledge generation can only happen in the networks. Uh, and uh, it is possible to people who don't share that knowledge. <laughs> Uh, and uh, if uh, if we get requests uh, from businesses to support whatever they do, uh, and they say, well, we have everything patented uh, and we can't really share what we do, then uh, I'm not so convinced how how useful Toloka contribution would be there and how useful that would be to the broader society. Uh, our aim is to to maximize the uh, the support of the uh, of the society as a whole and not some individual individual businesses as steven said these are taxpayers money german taxpayers money but it makes sense that if the money comes from uh, from the broad society it serves the broad society uh, so uh, and another critical uh, aspect of open source technologies whether software whether hardware uh, is the the learning aspect of it. Uh, a lot of open source tools are not as polished. Uh, they require a bit of attention. They require a bit of work. They require a bit of tinkering around, but they slow down the process. Uh, so a lot of industrial, uh, uh, a lot of industrial initiatives, a lot of businesses, they would look at open source tools and say, well, but this doesn't do exactly what we need on the production line. And fair enough, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, a fabu laser is not a drop-in replacement for a trotec machine. Uh, if if your aim is to maximize the output of uh, uh, laser cut keychains and toys, uh, it is not a substitute for a cheap Chinese machine neither, because uh, it is uh, it is more expensive than than a Chinese machine and requires a bit more attention. But what it is a replacement for, it could probably be a replacement for. Uh, uh, full uh, electromechanical engineering curriculum uh, for people who uh, go through the process of building troubleshooting servicing and working with this machine for for, for some time uh, they build they build expertise and ultimately it's the expertise uh, local expertise that is key in the long term uh, to be able to uh, to uh, kind of to grow economy and to grow the uh, the society's uh, potential with this, uh, I am getting as close. I'm trying to avoid that uh, that vocabulary for now, but uh, uh, it's I'm getting to a point to kind of 
to say that, yeah, I don't want Ukraine to be colonized by Western tech companies. Uh, I want uh, I want Ukrainian community to develop their own expertise, uh, apply their own know-how, uh, and uh, maybe people who learn using open source tools uh, that Toloka brings and Toloka supports, they will go after that and use that expertise to build their own businesses for their own. Amazing, yeah. fantastic, and that's how it should be happening. Uh, but that means that uh, the doors are open to so many more people to to follow that path, to follow that trajectory, and to uh, to build their expertise. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking kind of for ways to to make sure that as much of what we do is uh, is absolutely open, publishable, and available and shareable. So that's that's that. Yeah, maybe I can uh, thank you. Uh... Constantly, I mean, I I agree totally with you, but I think in some nuance, I would maybe even disagree. Um, I would say that actually most industry is built up on open source tools, right? Um, I mean, uh, the software industry for sure. Microsoft is a great example. Um, if if um, this the notion of open source wasn't there. Uh, these these companies would not exist. Um, they're just very good at packaging and then shutting down, uh, you know, the the box and then and then selling it. Um, and you know, much of what we do is, you know, I would say maybe opening up the boxes um, and looking inside and seeing what bits we can actually use without maybe getting in trouble or whatever to make a better one. Um, and and this is also part of let's say the idea of open source, but open source and open culture are not necessarily exactly the same thing, right? Uh, open culture is, is, let's say more than just open source. It's, it's also an attitude and a, and a, and a philosophy, of course, um, that you know, connects exactly with, you know, with what you were saying, um, which I suppose in the bottom line is about sharing knowledge, but also enabling access to information where people might not even know that this information exists. Um, and this is, this, is, this, is, this is kind of like a weird little challenge that we somehow have. Like, how do you know to go after something that you don't know, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean? Um, so part of the work that we do um, that, We've done, I mean, for better or for worse, mostly in places like South Sudan, where um, you know access to electricity and the internet is already a challenge. Um, is you know we we've developed some uh, what we call open culture resources, uh, which are totally non-digital. Like we make some posters, for example, that explain or just show uh, or list all kinds of websites for open knowledge resources. Um, because when you're sitting in front of a blank screen and let's say nobody has ever told you about Wikipedia and what Wikipedia is, how do you know that you're gonna go look for it, right? Um, so I actually have this poster here behind me. Uh, so, you know, it's... It's not a digital thing. It's 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 a damn poster, <laughs> um, but it, it's you know you hang you hang something like that up in a classroom or in a computer center, and all of a sudden oh so there's a tool that I can edit audio with that I don't have to pay a hundred bucks for, um, or there's a platform uh, called Apropedia which is about appropriate technologies, open source technologies, open hardware technologies, and Apro Apropedia, uh, Fadia is also on the list that I sent you. Um, you know, it's like a Wikipedia for things that are made. So people know, people who know, they know they can go there and find information about things that people have tried to do and have built that are maybe slightly different than the few things that you can get on the shelf at the store or these online places. Because 
Constantine, I think you can you would probably agree that as we've gone more and more into, let's say, the industrialization of knowledge, that the choice of products shrinks. So even in China, there's less and less, let's say, built things that we can buy um, because of this necessity to package and sell, right? Um, but all those elements, you know, they're they're out there. Um, so what what um, you know what I think is interesting, you know, also in the in, in the context of Ukraine, is is really, I won't I wouldn't say aggressively, but very consciously and strategically using these platforms, using these knowledge resources to publish the things that are being made, um, which are maybe slightly different than other places because of the particular challenges that exist uh, in Ukraine. And you will see that, oh, wow, well, I'm maybe in Thailand, and this is, this is this amazing. Like I've been looking for this forever. It's like, wow, you guys are making this. Um, so this is of course where, you know, maker culture, of open innovation, uh, whatever start, you know, to collude and combine uh, or intersect um, and in no way takes away from, let's say the necessity to also generate income. Right, because you have to generate income, um, but how do you do that? You do that by also, um, you know, offering your knowledge, um, sharing it in order that people you help people put the other things together, um, or maybe you put something together and get you know sell it to them. Um, but all this stuff that's out there, um, I think, is much much richer in the kind of open culture world than in the very closed proprietary hermetically sealed culture uh, consumer world. Right? <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. So, yeah. No, you go ahead. So uh, I guess the, the question is then what is exactly, what what is the definition, the, the kind of the border between the the open culture world and the consumer world and well i mean i I, uh, I, I, would say, I would say there's there isn't necessarily a hard border on these things right like um there's there's certainly a gray zone um i guess it depends on um whether you know consu consumerism is a nasty thing or a good thing um it, it it's it's very much you know about attitude and process um and like the the i mean you know and i think a lot of people on the call here know that the proprietary world um the corporate world let's say is very 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 good at locking down you know their their products they have to do that um and make sure that no one else kind of wiggles into their space. Um, one of the very good examples is Microsoft. I am sure that most people who are in the call here are users of Microsoft Office. And this always confounds me. I have no idea why people use a crappy American software uh, that's full of security risks and worms and then you have to pay for a damn license to use it on top of it when you have equally as good or better tools like LibreOffice.org, right? I mean, for the 90% the of the things that we use this particular software for, um, there's amazingly good alternative products that don't cost anything, they have updates all the time. They have a huge community who's looking out for bugs and security issues and so on. You don't have to find somebody in some room somewhere on a toll-free number. Um, and 
Yeah. So, yeah. you know, on a very kind of banal and basic level, um, a lot of open source tools, um, they're not more difficult to use than commercial or proprietary tools. Yes, there are some very specialized ones, some that are being developed and so on. But, but there is, for example, uh, there's, there's a site that I love, and I love to share it all the time, called osalt.com. Uh, again, Fadia, it's on the I list the that I sent. It's the Open Source Alternatives website. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful and very simple thing. It's like, uh, what's an alternative to Photoshop? Yeah. I can't afford Photoshop or I don't want to buy a cracked version and screw up my system. So I go to osalt.com and it gives me alternatives to Photoshop that are open source. And it, it shows what the differences are. Um, and in some cases you might decide, well, for what I'm doing, I actually do need the proprietary version of this or that. I mean, that, you know, that, that, in, that can happen. Um, but the, the point is to have the choice to be able to choose the best tool for the right job and the best tool uh, that industry pushes out there and spends huge amounts on advertising and other kinds of tricks to make sure you don't know about these other tools, um, you know, can be subverted very easily. Um, by uh, using your resource like uh, osalt.com. We're drifting off a little bit into open source evangelism, which I totally support and <laughs> think is 100% the right thing to do. However, while we're all here, I'm curious to um, to, to understand, like I, I have a lot more questions than answers in all of this. So for me, it's like, how, how is that on the ground in practice in Ukraine as well as elsewhere? Maybe, maybe we can um, loop everybody into this conversation so everybody wants to talk about it. Please join us and, and, and share your, your thoughts, your questions, your ideas. Yeah. I always wonder, yeah, right, so we understand that. And then there are these spaces that can literally hold space for people who think like that um how 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 does it how are you engaged with it what what is what is your take on this are you hearing about open culture for the first time today are you an evangelist like steve for either open source software or hardware or both or are you somebody who's not into software or hardware at all, but who believes in the fundamentals of open culture and sharing and coming together also in solidarity, hashtag Toloka, um, to, um, to, to work on things together and solve, solve problems and change systems together. Um, so I've been talking a lot, uh, a long time now to uh, uh, allow people to open their mics, raise their hands, whatever you wanna do. Um, to hopefully get to that point where people join us in talking. Yeah, yeah, I, I would, I would really, really love to hear from um, you know our friends and colleagues in in Ukraine, um, and you know, very, very happy, you know, to to answer questions or to give you know comments. But like uh, Constantine and I, we're we're kind of talking sort of you know into a general void. Um, obviously, Constantine knows his colleagues in the context very well. Um, I don't really. Um, and that because, you know, like you say, Vicky, this is a very wide territory. Um, and I think the call today very much is focused on creating an interaction or trying to uh, support a conversation uh, with um, our friends and colleagues in Ukraine. Um, you know, please step up, step up to the microphone. <laughs> And yeah, if there's language, language issues, um, I would say, you know, try another language and somebody will translate. Yeah, also Constantine is logging off and logging back in because his internet is flaky. But I know for a fact that Natalia speaks both Ukrainian and English and German um, because she's brilliant. Um, 
and Sergi worked as a translator for us in Chinese a couple of times. So um, joining this conversation in Ukrainian is a total possibility. Um, and sorry for putting you both on the spot, Natalia and Sergi, but I just had to. And we're really trying to break the ice here. So even if you just want to say, well, I never heard of open culture before, and it sounded interesting, so that's why I'm here. That's also totally fine. We would really like to 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 like Steve, not only you to meet Steve, but also Steve to meet you. And I see two cameras on, so I'm 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 optimistic. Natalia, you're muted. I see you. I I ah. can yes. I, I thank you very much for invitation. I'm very uh, happy to be today with you and listen to you. And to be honest, um, I'm just listening to you and I'm just thinking. So I don't, I never heard about this concept of open culture as a concept of the, as a project or as a, as a concept of, of work, but I think I'm living this concept in my life. So this, um, um, it's not about a hard or software, uh, more or less, but about events and about um, daily life, how to how we are because I'm I'm actually working in the NGO sphere. Uh, at the moment, I work for civil grid support and leave no one behind a campaign like this is a, a bigger campaign that uh, is well known, and and also in alliance of Ukrainian organizations and open platform, a, a new organization where we are working on the political topics, but also educational topics. And I was also I make notice. Um, a short uh, um, brief notice for me that it may be also a great idea to share on the web page the sources for people that maybe never will think about this oh yeah of course we have a lot of open source um, possibilities and you can also tell about this and speak about this in different events uh, so for me it's very exciting I, I i am also very impressed what constantine said that um how how it is worked in ukraine and what is this idea to show um or not let ukraine to be <laughs> i will just uh, say what he said to be colonized uh, from western part of europe because it's I think dangerous to speak, but this to have this understanding and to have this, um, yeah, just to understand the situation and work uh, in this in this direction, uh, it's very important. And I think a lot of people are living also this way and um, are not really bewusst, <laughs> um, aware, <laughs> aware, about, aware about this, you know. And it's great to be aware about this because I think then you can develop it better and involve more people in this process so i'm very uh, happy to be here and thank you very much for this invitation for your invitation vicky it's a big pleasure and uh yeah yeah great thank you great to hear from you natalia um and you know on that comment that you know constantine you know made about sort of you know the, the colonialization from the west um you know or from europe or whatever i mean it's it's not even so much that as it is, let's say, the the colonialization of big big industry in general, right? Uh, whether it's coming from the West or the East or China or U.S., um, the the point is that um, there's there's good stuff in there and there's bad stuff in there. The point is really that um, it's how you take control of your let's say in a certain sense, maybe your, 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 your technological sphere, uh, which includes your own personal data, um, you know, the things in your daily life. Um, and, you know, if you stay on top of that, um, then you don't necessarily have the problem of, let's say, being colonialized, but you can take the elements that you need from that um, you know, in order to strengthen, um, you know, the, the kind of scenario that you're in. Um, and one of the things that I, I worry, maybe worry is not quite the right word, but maybe something against to be bewusst about, to be aware of, is that, you know, for example, um, we, most of us tend to use, for example, Google Maps, right? 
Uh, I'm sure that Google Maps are used extensively in the Ukraine. Um, of course, when you use Google Maps and you're not aware of how to protect your own movement within the Google environment, which is very difficult these days because Google is so interlinked with everything, um, you know, your movement, um, and if we want to put it into a conflict scenario, can very easily be used, you know, by your adversaries against you. Um, and I don't mean this just in the context of Ukraine. Um, I mean this in a, in, a, in a lot of different contexts where identity, movement, uh, location are, you know, are extremely important. Um, and people who are, people in organizations who are there to try to find these things out about you without your knowledge, they're very good at it. Um, they also tend to be paid a lot. Um, and there is this thing called open street maps, for example, um, which does not have this same scenario of corporate data tracking. So you are able to use an open street map to develop very, very precise mapping tools and trajectories and things, but you retain control you know, over your own identity uh, in that. And so again, it's a thing about choice and awareness at the same time. And this is also very important in a notion of, of open culture um, that we don't have to get railroaded into one very specific thing. And so when we talk about you know, colonialization, I mean, Google is, a, is, is kind of a colonial organization as well, right? Um, and so when we're working in, in sensitive locations and we work with you know, geo data uh, and stuff, um, you know, these, these are also um, important things to be aware of. You're evangelizing again, and Sorry. I love it. <laughs> I also added maps.me to the, to the chat, because I know that a lot more people in Ukraine use maps than Google because it's offline. Um, so it's not so much the tracking, but the availability of offline maps. And I know that he put on his camera and um, I would really, because there's so many things where I thought of you that we talked about. So I really wanted to give you the microphone and, and have, have all of us meet you. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, good evening all. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous because of my English, but I will try to explain my thoughts shortly. I'm uh, something like a guy from Chernihiv. Uh, uh, I live here all my life and I'm trying to break the rules. I'm trying to fix the city by methods of tactical urbanism and I see how it works. I'm trying to involve as much use in the fixing cities, in preparing better public spaces. And for me, maybe to the second enter into the open uh, world, so-called. First, my entering was while Tolokar visiting Chernihiv, and we implement uh, uh, maybe five different topics uh, and different uh, levels of a city. Uh, during only two weeks with Tolokar and for, for me it was another changing of my viewing how it works in the world and uh, I'm really excited and I'm uh, really happy to be here today and uh, uh, a lot of thanks to Vicky, to Kostya and to all uh, our partners from Western U uh, Europe for the the possibilities which we can use during this period of war period, we can use this period of uh, crisis to prepare and to change something in a better way. And we are trying to be uh, motivated, we're trying to be uh, uh, open mind and we're trying to use all possibilities uh, while we have this uh, open window because we feel that. Uh, we never met such many uh, different uh, people from abroad in Chernihiv uh, like like now. 
uh, every day we have uh, some propositions from different uh, architectural urbanists uh, scientists from all over the world and we're trying to help them to communicate with our government and with our local municipality because sometimes uh, bureau bureaucracy stops everything in ukraine and uh, uh, we try to be flexible and to change the rules even uh, with the possibilities of war i mean that uh, not we have a lot of uh, possibilities for last year but we lose many of them because of bureaucracy because of corruption and because of uh, uh, of uh, another thinking of our government and our local municipalities and uh, i think that uh, these connections which we uh, start with civil society with ngos is much more uh, perspective much more flexible and uh, we will keep connections and uh, we're looking for next uh, next steps and of course uh, i am saving all the links which uh, vicky posted in the chat i will share it with my team and we uh, we're very happy for the possibility to join in such a nice uh force and such a nice uh community of open source and of open uh, uh culture. <laughs> oh, yeah thank you <laughs> yeah Sergei, i love i love your idea of tactical urbanism it's not just an idea like they built like nobody here brags enough about themselves, so I'm going to do it. Um, so what, what they did in Geneva is first they built, they just took a park and they made it into somewhere people wanted to go and hang out just by doing small, small interventions that they thought about very creatively. And um, they are like, they are the people who paint um, bike lanes on the streets with chalk. Um, <laughs> so long until there is an actual bike lane there, which takes even longer in Geneva than it does in Berlin. And um, right now, Sergei is, is, is leading a group of people who will transform a beautiful old cinema into a fab lab in Geneva. So I'm very excited about it. And I needed to share it with all of the people here because there's a few people who run makerspaces. There's going to be a fab lab in Geneva soon. I'm, I'm, and, and, if all of that happened just because the Tolokas came, or if that was the catalyst moment that kicked this off, then yeah, that's that's just really, really cool. And I'm, I love hearing that. Who else? Yuri, do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on? Or um, I don't know, I don't see, uh, like everybody else has their camera switched off. Um, we have like seven more minutes. Fadia is coming back in. <laughs> Um, what's I unfortunately up? have to leave. I just wanted to say it's been incredible um, <laughs> to hear everyone talk. And I, I, I mean, it's really, I have no input at this point, but just was wondering as I listened to everyone, how little have we spoken about um, open culture and how very necessary, um, given what we're all doing and being part of this uh, uh, lovely community, that we speak more of that. And, and I just had this thought that actually what unites all of us is that we all believe in that, right, and manifest it in a different way through our work, through what we produce with working with our local communities or whatever uh, we're doing. So it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't uh, repeat that enough. Thank you for hosting us and for having us. And I, I fully agree that that and we also actually don't have to talk about it because this is open culture. Um, so I see that Yuri is showing us this guy over Kiev. <laughs> so how is it going? Thanks. Uh, thank you for an invitation, Stu, and nice to meet you. Happy to be here with you. And, uh, as for open culture, I, I used to subscribe to almost all the links Stephen provides when we prepare makerfairs uh, 
before to to understand this this to, to uh, make an opinion about that, to, to understand how to negotiate the makers with the package spaces on uh, places like this. Um, so this is my um, my part. Yeah. Thank you so so much. Who, who else? We have five more minutes to go. Do you want to tell us about what you're doing? I know everybody in this call, I think. So. Um, I, I was just curious to know, uh, Natalie, Natalia, where, where are you located? I'm actually in Berlin and I have been living in Berlin since uh, 19 years. So I'm very... Uh, I, my heart is, uh, uh, of course, in Ukraine, and I'm working a lot to Ukraine topics. But I'm I'm based in Berlin. Okay, so we should meet up. It would be a big pleasure. <laughs> you will. Never mind. I'm. I'll, I have it on my list. I was a bit distracted the first couple of months, but um, it's it's on my list. Adriana, I can see your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. I am in a train. That's why I. I don't know how it's my connection. Uh, so I am living in Dusseldorf and I was uh, very interested in uh, the topic and also because uh, in the past days in, in Hamburg, we had the opportunity to exchange about the project she makes. And I was thinking that it was a so beautiful idea to think how really values uh, are coming through the culture. I think that that's so a very important point that we are bringing in the in the let's say maker of app community in the mindset and tool set and skill sets because we cannot only just point in let's say the tool set what we are bringing in let's say of course in, in the in, in in the fab labs or in the or, 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 let's say in the telecar but also the how we can really bring uh, a better let's say mindset and especially um, I was uh, thinking, I, I am from Colombia originally, um, how we have to, or we can unlearn things, or let's say a culture of maybe some um, very difficult times and learn really these enabling practices what we are uh, doing in the lab. And uh, this is also, let's say, part of my dream. <laughs> and I wanted also to share with you because I think that especially when, when we uh, talk today about this transformation in in an unstable, let's say, a contest, uh, I think that that, would, that is very, very important. So that's something that I wanted just to, to bring and also how, how to bring this uh, field of of community, of a community that it's bringing, uh, um, let's say, a, a better future. And I think that that's uh, what I wanted to bring to, to the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Uh, great, Adriana. We heard you fine, loud and clear. And, and also, I just want to uh, reinforce that one point that you made about enabling practices, right? Or practices that in themselves are enabling. So this is also, of course, a key element of, of, uh, of, I guess, what I think, you know, open culture uh, is about. The whole notion of creating environments in which people are enabled to do things. Um, and, you know, this is, this is also, you know, it, it is a philosophical um, and kind of, you know, existential thing, which is radically different than a lot of corporate culture in a certain way, which is not necessarily there to actually enable. They enable people to do things. They say they do, but then you end up in a, in a lot of dead ends. So um, creating space to enable, um, which of course is, is one of the tenets of creating also a, a maker space, um, is, is, is a key concept. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add that one to my list of very nice little concepts <laughs> and, and, and i think that also the 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 theory of change you know that we can really bring change to our big uh, societal challenges i think that that's uh, bringing more like sustainability in an, in a different way because i think that uh, if we think about the generations and this responsibility how we approach technologies is 
very important in order to what you said, like uh, thinking more, uh, bring this awareness and bring a little bit more uh, responsibility in a way how we approach uh, like a problem or how we develop technologies in, in future. I think that this is also very important in how we approach also this open technology that's uh, this, this, uh, this change that it's bringing and this access that is bringing this open culture. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, Vicky, I mean, uh, Fadia is gone at six. I, I don't know if the call shuts down. <laughs> on. Uh, I'm the host now. So okay. I wanted to ask uh, how, how you all feel. And I wanted to kind of allow people to leave if they want to leave or have to leave. Um, I don't have to go anywhere. I'm, I can also hang out a little bit longer. It depends on everybody else. Yeah, I, I have. I also have a little bit more time. I just wanted to point out, just in case it does shut down and people leave, um, that list of links that I sent uh, to you, Vicky and Fadia, for things that I I might refer to. It's all in the chat. Yeah. So I just wanted just to tell people this is this is really kind of a random list, right? It's it's really a tip of the iceberg um, of certain things. Um, that each has its own big narrative and story uh, around it. Um, and um, I know that from the people who are here in the call in the Git community, they also, you know, they have their own lists like this and also their own projects and so on, which are not necessarily. And so I don't want to, I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. It was really just in order for, um, you know, certain conversations, certain examples. Um, and I, one of the examples that I put in there um, a little bit randomly, but also as a, as a, um, uh, as a very practical example, let's say of documentation, which is also extremely important in open culture, like to be able to document things you do and how you do it in order to be able to, you know, communicate it and share it with other people. Um, is um, uh, da, 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 da. I, I, I did put it in there somewhere, and I just I'm only saying this now because I see that there's somebody called Chardso in the chat right now. It's uh, our dear friend from Asnet, uh, Vafala Andrew, who is actually in Uganda, um, and he he has developed a wonderful uh, practice of documenting his innovation, his ideas um, on, um, on GitHub. Um, they're not always perfect, um, but it's a very, very effective way of starting a conversation with others to help you further develop your ideas. Um, so on that, on that list uh, that I sent, it's I think the one and only GitHub list which I took again a little bit randomly, but thank you, Vafala, and nice to see you uh, here as well in the um, in in the call. Um, great. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, we we haven't taken a decision. Nobody has left. I think. Oh, Vafala, I see your hand. Um, yeah. Shall we say ten ten minutes? Yeah, and Natalia also put her. Yeah, put her okay. Back. Let's say ten more minutes. I'll I'll keep reminding of the time. Okay. Okay. Rafael, I go. Nope, we can't hear you. Oh, Vafala, your sound is off. <laughs> You're not muted by me, so oops, that should work. Um, but maybe. Maybe if Vafala, maybe his microphone connection is not uh, active. Uh, maybe while we wait for him to get his sound, now he is muted. Um, yeah. But we could, maybe while he gets that sorted out, we can bring uh, Natalia in. Natalia uh, just got, she left, she's not here anymore. And I'm looking at the, this is, this is really, uh, I don't nope. know, maybe, maybe Constantine has a final word. Now he's been quiet in the last part of this, <laughs> this discussion. Yeah, I, uh, I was thinking, I mean, when you, when you brought up the example, say, of OpenStreetMap, that's exactly the, the kind of the 
I think I was saying that uh, open source tools are not quite as polished, not quite as uh, user friendly than industrial tools are. And that's actually, that's a great example. But so at the same time, their roughness, it does require to kind of to step up and take a bit more agency about what you're doing. So it's, uh, it moves you from being purely a consumer of these tools. It moves you to a space that uh, you need to be a bit more proactive. You need to be a little bit more understanding of the tools you're using uh, and find ways kind of how to bend them and to get them to do what you want them to do. Uh, and which is, in some cases, it's a great thing, In some, but it requires resource. It requires people time. It requires people's attention. It requires people's focus. Uh, and uh, uh, it is unreasonable to expect that everybody could just uh, immediately dump Google Maps and start using OpenStreetMap just because it doesn't really take you from point A to point B when you need to figure out your daily commute uh, and so sort a lot of things on the way. So. But uh, at the same time, I think the what I what I am trying to to understand is uh, because all of these things they're kind of inevitable. They they uh, and they need to be present in this world and in this society for it to function. It would be too naive to say, well, let's kind of dump all of the commercial stuff and replace it purely with open source. It's it's just not going to happen. But kind of where is and which exactly role? each of these plays in the society which of this uh, which of the needs are being covered by each of these parts of uh technology in this case is uh is the question is the question i'm interested in and uh what i am kind of i mean rhine metal is uh planning to build a factory in, in ukraine building tanks uh and it's uh, tanks are not really open source, uh, but BRL CAD, the CAD tool that is used, that was developed at uh, uh, by US Army, they have open sourced BRL CAD. It's the tool they use to design tanks. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, kind of, how much, where, at which, at which stage of using various tools and kind of learning about them where where do you need to kind of mm, yeah uh, a little bit fuzzy the other observation i wanted to say sorry for kind of i'm a bit rambling in some places i hope i hope it kind of there's a bit of a patchwork emerging uh of the, the issues kind of i'm trying to uh to address uh, uh open source tools normally evolve much much slower they have a much kind of longer arc of, uh, of their life cycle uh, which is which can be a difficult thing for industry when things move fast but uh, for for the culture uh, it is and for education it's an amazing thing because uh, if you have learned photoshop uh, 20 years ago and you open it now that's that's a completely different tool i mean there may be kind of some basic concepts of layers uh, staying in place but effectively you have to relearn everything and unless you stay an active user of photoshop if this is the tool that you would like to turn on uh, once every couple of years when you have kind of a need so uh to uh, to work with uh, some photos in that in that way uh you either need to pay for it you need to relearn it you have to pay uh, you have to put so much effort whereas if you once you kind of have invested your time into tool like GIMP. Uh, GIMP is much, much slower evolving. And uh, GIMP 20 years ago <laughs> was not that radically different from GIMP that is today, uh, which may be seen uh, kind of as a as a problem for industrial users, but uh, for a general kind of social good, it is a fantastic thing. Uh, I experienced that when I was using Blender in uh, in early 2000s uh, somewhere around the time Vicky was uh, talking about about Rotterdam and probably around the time uh, uh, Stephen you were in Rotterdam but then 20 years later I opened Blender and I almost feel at home uh, and the tool has just grown more powerful but everything that I learned about it all of that time ago it stayed with me uh, and uh, 
this is why I believe that, especially in educational context, uh, the kind of the longevity of skills and knowledge that one gains through mastering and using open source tools is uh, is the most transformative. Uh, yeah. So actually, here's here's one one last one last kind of uh, thing is that when we talk about open culture and closed industry, effectively, I mean those are those are the things. By the, I think that's this almost kind of the definition that the the culture is open. If we talk about culture, we talk about uh, uh, general kind of uh, literacy. Neil Gershenfeld al always uses this this term, uh, but it's effectively culture that allows people to communicate, to exchange information, exchange knowledge, and that's that's it's open by necessity by definition. What is industry? uh which is so culture is built for exploration and communication industry is basically exploitation uh and kind of gaining advantage and that is kind of industry will stay closed and kind of i think fighting fighting that to to change the industry to be open i mean kind of campaigning rain metal to open source their their tanks design I don't think much uh, uh, much will come uh, of it, but the spectacular thing is that actually the tools that are used to design tanks are open source. So, and exactly this is what we started the conversation with is uh, when people learn to use open source tools, but then they kind of go on and use those skills to already do anything they want beyond uh, kind of for whichever purposes they need. That is that is how it should be uh, but if uh, kind of we're talking about systemic change of the society or they, this this is where uh, uh, introducing open source tools is is critical but it's also important to be kind of upfront and honest uh, about the uh, kind of role and their capacity because I think uh, uh, yeah uh try 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 trying try to push through the, the message that, that there's identical kind of one-to-one -one or even better alternatives to close tools uh will just bring kind of more disappointment in uh in people because even even if the tool is as equally capable but it requires them to relearn a lot of new things they they will not do it uh if if approached purely from this perspective kind of well here's there, there was your commercial tool here's your free open source tool that does exactly the same thing i uh, i find it difficult to communicate it this way okay i'm done <laughs> sorry sorry i said that in the beginning it's three people that talk a lot um and i <laughs> that resonates with me a lot this whole topic of unlearning that adriana also brought up like and and i i don't think the the the, the best way is to you know, delete your closed source apps and applications and all of that and replace them from one day to the other. But there's so many people out there who don't even know about open source alternatives and who have never thought about this. And we're like privileged and lucky that we do. And also that, I mean, the privilege of age uh, that we've seen them, like I, I also remember GIMP as being terrible. I'm now like, oh wow, GIMP isn't terrible anymore. That's really good to know. Um, I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> I haven't looked at it for 10 years because I so didn't like it. And, um, and, and, and what you said, like it's evolving. And I don't want to get into the discussion about weapons and tanks. I hope we would get through a call without this topic. <laughs> But I want to say that I would like to see all vaccinations being open source and all um, medicines being open source. And that, I think, is something where we can get behind, that a big industry would be better for humanity if it wasn't that closed. And um, I hope that we um, can, can, um, can, can agree on all of this. Oh my gosh, and Miriam even shared the open next guidelines. This is excellent. Thank you. Um, cause, cause there were so many things, uh, that of course were not part of Steve's list and so many things where we could go on, like with all the EU projects that various people in this call have been involved in from critical making to make to open next to interfacer. 
um there's 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 all the projects that you yourself run um there's there's all the work that Afrilabs is doing um that i know a few of the people here in the room um are part of i always like i've, I've spent half a day talking about she makes yesterday again because for me this is the best um connection of academic research put into practice with learning paths for kids um, youth and adults turning innovation into entrepreneurship with a feminist perspective it 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 like takes all my boxes it's it's a brilliant project go check it out also wonderfully documented and there's so much that we should share and um, I, I have a friend who always said the internet is basically a repository and Google is the phone book because there's too many numbers now. Like you have this, it's hard to find things. And um, I, I keep hoping that there will be one repository for them all, which I guess is the internet. And I just have to deal with it that I won't get what I want. It's like this one thing where I go like, I want this and just give me the good people links. Um, but with calls like this and chats like this, I hope we can get there, get closer to it. Um, before we close the call, I would like to, and you can, you know what? We only, I, the only thing I, I want you to do is if this was cool for you and you would like to have more calls like this on open culture, on open source, topics on topics that like practical things like um wash is one thing that we're thinking about uh, water sanitation hygiene topics like how to build toilets basically in the wild um in ukraine and elsewhere but we always will focus on ukraine in these calls if you want more of these calls you give a thumbs up either through emoji or on the screen yep Thanks, two, three thumbs up from Saad. How to do that with two thumbs, it's amazing. Um, okay, I haven't seen a thumbs down, but I also didn't ask for it. And I wanna say thank you to all of you who came here. <clears throat> it's always dissatisfying because you have people who are spotlighted and people who are not. I hope I didn't make anybody uncomfortable by turning the spotlight to them. And I hope everybody who wanted to come into the spotlight had a chance to do so. I have been super happy to see you all and to hear from all of you. And um, it, it, it was a really great uh, way to spend my Wednesday late afternoon. Thank you so, so much. And with that, um, I say thank you. And whoever wants to stay stays, but thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Vicky, and everybody else. Great thank people. You all. <laughs> okay. Bye. And nice to meet you all. <laughs> oh, I'm checking out the chat so then I'm not missing anything. Yeah, yeah, that's why I was saying it's just like my my list was was definitely nowhere, nowhere even close to being <laughs> complete. It was. <laughs> All fine. Steve, I really have to check out here so the recording also stops. Yes. Okay. I'll call you. Bye. <laughs> okay. Ciao.